Hey there guys, my name is Siobhan Fallon. Welcome back to Custer's 7th Cavalry. Today we're going to discuss part two of Captain Miles Kehoe, his life and fight at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Thank you for joining me. Part one left off here at Fort Abraham Lincoln. Here's the famous picnic photo taken the previous summer at Little Heart River. And that's Keo standing next to George Armstrong Custer. In May 1876, Keo wrote his dear friend Nellie Martin a letter. And I'm going to read part of it because it puts us perfectly in the mind of Keo just before he departed on the campaign that would end his life, as well as that of 270 fellow members of the 7th Cavalry. We leave on Monday on an Indian expedition. And if I ever return, I will go on and see you all. I have requested to be packed up and shipped to Auburn in case I am killed, and I desire to be buried there. God bless you all. Remember, if I should die, you may believe that I loved you and every member of your family. It was a second home to me. The morning of May 17, 1876, began cold and foggy when Reveille sounded at 4 a.m., it was the first time all 12 companies of the 7th were united, and they were also just one part of three separate army columns sent out by President Ulysses Grant to force the Lakota and Cheyenne to return to their agencies. This is an image from the 1874 Black Hills expedition, but it gives you a sense of the scale of this sort of undertaking and what the departure from Fort Abraham Lincoln might have looked like. As I said, there was a lot more to this campaign than the 7th Cavalry. From the West, we have the Montana Column led by Colonel John Gibbon, and that was composed of infantry and the 2nd Cavalry under Major James Brisbane and an artillery attachment. From the Southeast, the Wyoming Column led by Brigadier General George Crook, and that had lots of cavalry, lots of infantry. There it is. And from the east, we have the Dakota Column led by General Alfred Terry with Custer commanding the 7th Cavalry. This column also included some infantry and, wait for it, a Gatling battery manned by men of the 20th Infantry. We're going to discuss that briefly later on. So everybody knew there was going to be a fight ahead. Mark Kellogg, the reporter from the Bismarck Tribune who accompanied the 7th Cavalry, had written an article that ran on May 18, 1876. The latest information brought in by the scouts from the hostile camps report Sitting Bull is having concentrated his entire camp near the Little Missouri River, almost due west of this point. His force is given as 1,500 lodges, at least 3,000 warriors. If the above information is true, lively times and heavy fighting may be looked for within the next few weeks. Mark Kellogg would also write, General Custer goes with the expedition second in command and in immediate command of his regiment, which is really the fighting force of the expedition. There was some pretty extreme weather going on that summer. There were lots of delays caused by rain, hail, ferocious storms, thunder, lightning. Within 10 days, the weather went from 44 degrees to 80 degrees. Then there were millions of grasshoppers, which Mark Kellogg described as locusts. Then there were swarms of mosquitoes. Dr. DeWolf would write to his wife, the mosquitoes have bitten my hands badly, my face they cannot get at for hair and dirt. There were difficult water crossings. They were traveling through sodden ground in some places and then nearly impassable canyons and badlands in others. So Keo was probably not looking this polished. On May 28th, Private Francis Johnson of Keogh's Eye Company was bitten in the finger by a rattlesnake. Actually, the young man's name was Francis Kennedy, and he had been born in Ireland, but he joined the Army under a false name as an underage enlistee to escape parents who wanted him to be a Catholic priest. 
with about 50 soldiers watching. His snake bite wound was cauterized and the patient was given 26 ounces of whiskey for its curative powers. <laughs> Afterwards, 17 year old Johnson was placed in an ambulance and he began to sing and quote, got well. Though Dr. DeWolf wrote in his diary that the soldier later vomited, quote, from the whiskey perhaps. But not only did the snake bite get Francis Johnson Kennedy more than three cups of whiskey and probably a heck of a headache the next day, it also saved his life. Because of that wound, he was left with a pack train on June 25th. But sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. The crazy weather continued. On the night of May 30th, the hot weather suddenly turned icy and there was sleet. On June 1st, a snowstorm. There were more delays. Even famed scout Charlie Reynolds got them lost. General Terry wrote his sister about his frustrations about not being as far along as he had hoped. On June 8th, General Terry left Custer in command of the Dakota Column, and he went on a scout down the valley of the Powder River to its mouth with Captain Miles Keogh's I Company and also Captain Miles Moylan's A Company. They would return to the main command on June 9th. Around this time, a letter sent to the New York Herald, thought to have been written by Custer, said, if the Indians are anywhere in the vicinity where they are reported to be, the prospect of discovering them is excellent. Or, as I heard an Irish cavalryman put it the other day, there is a mighty fine chance of a fight or a foot race. On June 10th, General Terry sent Major Reno on a scout with the right wing of the 7th. This was Captain Keogh commanding companies B, C, and his I Company, and with Captain George Yates commanding E, F, and L companies. Also accompanying the Reno Scout was a Gatling gun, and it was a nightmare. At one point, it turned over, injuring mules and a soldier, slowed them down at every step. So when people ask, why didn't Custer bring a Gatling gun to the Little Bighorn fight? This Reno Scout is the reason. Reno Scout returned to the main column on June 20th, bringing back information about the movements of the Sioux and Cheyenne and that the numbers were large and growing. But Reno managed to infuriate both of his commanding officers. General Terry wrote of Reno's, quote, flagrant disobedience of orders and that Reno, quote, had done this in defiance of my position or positive order not to go to the Rosebud. General Terry was angry because Reno went too far, but Custer was angry because Reno went too far, but then did not go far enough and overtake the Indians and fight them. Terry and Custer feared Reno had gotten so close to the Indians that they were pursuing that the Indians were now alerted to the column drawing near and that the Indians would scatter rather than be brought to battle. And if this happened, the entire summer campaign was lost. What did Keogh think of the scout? Remember, Keogh had been on the boundary survey with Reno in 1873. He'd also been at Fort Abraham Lincoln when Reno was left in command while Custer was testifying before Congress from late winter of 1875 to early May of 1876. I'd wager Keogh knew, knew Reno better than most of the other seventh officers did. Here is an excerpt from the private collection of Little Bighorn scholar George Cush from a letter Lieutenant William Weiner Cook wrote to his father on June 21st, 1876. Quote, Feelings are running quite high here over Colonel Reno's flagrant disobedience of his written orders. He has been severely censored by General Terry's order and has been relieved of all duties with this expedition. Reno has personally appealed to General Custer as a fellow soldier to intercede upon his behalf and allow him to accompany our command. But if Mr. Keogh was allowed to have his way, 
our gallant colonel would be sent packing on the first boat back to Lincoln. On June 21st, General Terry had a conference aboard the steamer the Far West with Lieutenant Colonel Custer, Colonel Gibbon, Major Brisbane, and a few other high-ranking officers. They mapped out a tenuous plan to pin the hostile force between Custer's column and that of Gibbons, whom Terry would travel with. Terry's official order to Custer said, it is impossible to give you any definite instructions in regard to this movement, and were it not impossible to do so, the department commander places too much confidence in your zeal, energy, and ability to wish to impose upon you precise orders which might hamper your actions when nearly in contact with the enemy. Lieutenant Bradley of Gibbon's column would write in his diary, it is understood that if Custer arrives first, he is at liberty to attack at once if he deems prudent. Afterwards, Custer gathered his officers together, relating how the 7th Cavalry would be striking out on its own the following morning. Keogh did not seem happy about this. Remember, Keogh had been on Reno's scout and seen with his own eyes the large trail and other evidence of the gathering of the tribes ahead. According to Major Brisbane's private diary, on the evening of the 21st of June, 1876, I was on the steamer the Far West and saw Colonel Keogh. Keogh was much depressed. He said he deplored the rashness of Custer and did not wish to see him sent out alone. He urged me to join Custer with my cavalry and thus strengthen the column. I promised to mention the matter to Custer and soon afterwards spoke to General Terry about uniting the 7th and 2nd Cavalry and going in person in command. Major Brisbane also wrote, the Montana column felt disappointed when they learned they were not to be present at the final capture of the great village, but General Terry's reasons for according this honor of the attack to General Custer were good ones. It was decided Custer's men were, as usual, to have the post of honor. That night, Keogh prepared his will with Lieutenant Carland of the 6th Infantry. He wasn't the only one. Lieutenant Edward S. Godfrey wrote, Nearly everyone took time to write letters home, but I doubt very much if there were many of a cheerful nature. Some officers made their wills. They seemed to have a presentiment of their fate. Annie Yates later wrote that Keogh said, I don't know what may happen to me, and as I have not disposed of some things I have, I want to make a will. The will indicated that his friend Henry Nolan would receive a thousand dollars and that Nolan would send mementos to his family in Ireland. Keogh gave this will to Nolan, telling him he also left papers with Mrs. Eliza Porter, the wife of Keogh's second in command, Lieutenant James Porter, to be burned unless Nolan thought some of them should be sent home to his family in Ireland. There I spent my youth and to tell you Truth. I was sad to leave it all behind me. On June 22nd, the 7th began their journey alone. The mules were incredibly difficult, especially those pack mules who had been on Reno's scout, who had developed raised sores so painful to the touch that tears matted the hair below their eyes. On June 23rd, Keogh, Winfield Edgerly, and Keogh's second lieutenant, James Porter, sang songs together and talked. Keogh said he wanted to write Edgerly's wife and ask her to pick up some things for his bachelor quarters. On June 24th, the 7th Cavalry marched to Muddy Creek. Benteen recounts the scene to his wife in a letter. On coming into camp, I heard the voice of my old friend, Colonel Miles W. Keogh, hailing me, saying, Come here, old man. I've kept the nicest spot in the hole next to me for your troop, and I've had to bluff the balance to hold it, but here it is. So I put my troop in the veil the gallant Irishman had held for me. It wasn't far from twilight then, so after getting supper, Keogh came over to my blueberry bush. He was more luxurious than I was, having a tent for shelter and the crowd was listening to one of the Italian patriot de Rudio's recitals of his hairbreadth escapes with Manzini, 
or some other man in some other country, all of which I rudely interrupted by saying, See here, fellas, you'll want to be collecting all the sleep you can and be doing it soon. But before Benteen could even fall asleep, the orderly trumpeter announced they were moving out right away. Custer wanted to march through the night and then keep the seventh hidden the next day, attacking the Indians on the morning of June 26th. Benteen continued, if it took a minute to cross that pack train over the muddy, it took two hours. Other side of the creek, Colonel Keogh hunted me up he began the officer in charge of the rear guard. He was making the very air sulfurous with blue oaths, telling me of the situation. However, from having been there very many times myself, I knew it better than he did. So I consoled him with, never mind, old man, do the best you can, and it will come out all right. Well, Benteen was wrong. Things were about to get a lot worse. Early on the morning of June 25th, Custer joined his scouts at the Crow's Nest, near the divide between the Little Bighorn and the Rosebud Valleys. Indian scouts pointed out thousands of Indian ponies in the distance, which could only mean a large gathering of Indians. Custer learned that during the night, items fell off the pack mules and when the soldiers went back to get them, they found Indians eating from a box of hardtack. Custer's Indian scouts reported seeing parties of mounted braves nearby as well. As mentioned, Custer had wanted to attack at dawn the next day on June 26, but now they thought they had been spotted, so the delay was no longer feasible. Afraid the Sioux and Cheyenne would pack up and disappear, the Crow Scouts urged Custer to attack immediately. As 7th Cavalry Officer Edward Godfrey wrote, it is a rare occurrence in Indian warfare that gives a commander the opportunity to reconnoiter the enemy's position in daylight. When the signs indicate a hot trail or a near approach, the command judges his distance. At all events, his attack must be made with celerity and generally without other knowledge of the numbers of the opposing force. And that was just what Custer planned to do. However, Keogh, in a letter to Miles Moylan, way back in 1867, had written, I have never before appreciated the difficulty of pursuing Indians, and I have concluded that without knowing exactly where to surprise their camp, or having a guide who can track them at a run, it is a waste of horse flesh and time to endeavor to come against them. On the morning of June 25th, 1876, according to Custer historian George Cush, Captain Keogh decided to change horses. He had been riding his personal mount, a horse named Patty, that he loved. But he asked Lieutenant Edward Mathy if he could ride the government-owned horse whom Matthew was riding instead, and that horse was Comanche. Now, Kia supposedly felt a premonition of his death. Remember, he made out a will with very careful instructions just a couple of nights earlier. Kia had a long 7th Cavalry history with Comanche. According to Godfrey, Comanche was a clayback sorrel belonging to his troop I and ridden by Captain Keogh when General Sully made his expedition against the Southern Indians in September of 1868 to the Sand Hills on the North Folk Fork of the Canadian River, where Camp Supply was afterwards located. On that expedition, the horse was wounded under Keogh during one of the many fights he had, and Keogh christened the horse Comanche, and always after that rode this horse in the field. And Comanche had also been injured in the right shoulder in early 1872 when Keogh rode him during a skirmish with moonshiners in Kentucky. That was when the 7th and Keogh's company were doing reconstruction duty down south. All this to say, Keogh probably considered Comanche lucky in a fight. Whatever his reasons, Keogh striker Private Gustav Korn took Patty. Patty joined the pack train and made it through the day unscathed.
at approximately noon on June 25th, Custer called his officers together. He created four battalions with Major Reno leading A, G, and M. Benteen, as senior captain, received D, H, and K. B Company, under Captain Thomas McDougall, would accompany the pack train led by First Lieutenant Edward Mathy. The five remaining companies went with Custer and his headquarters staff. It's thought that Captain Keogh, who is the highest ranking captain within Custer's column, led the advance with C and I and L companies. With him went Captain George Yates leading E and F companies. Soon after determining these command columns, Custer sent Benteen off on a scout to the left to, quote, sweep everything before him in an effort to block the escape of any Indians and to drive them toward the main command. Although, remember our rattlesnake-bitten friend, Francis Johnson Kennedy of Keogh's Eye Company? He remembered it a slightly differently. After officers' call sounded, Custer took I, E, F, C, and L troops. Reno took three companies in his command, and Major Benteen took three companies, B being detailed as rear guard in place of I troop. The officers at this time got orders to bunch the mules together, with the exception of the ammunition mules, which were taken on ahead. And Custer, Reno, and Benteen charged in three different directions on the Indian camp, Custer taken the farthest to the right, Reno the center, and Benteen the left end. After Benteen and his men departed, Custer and Reno's companies continued to ride alongside each other for a few miles down what is now called Reno Creek. It was at a spot referred to as the Lone Teepee when interpreter Fred Gerard alerted Custer that the Indians were running. Custer sent Adjutant Lieutenant William Weiner Cook to tell Reno that the Indians were ahead and that Reno was to charge them. Reno twice asked if Custer was going to support him and Cook replied, yes. Reno and his column charged down the Little Bighorn Valley. In an interview at Walter Camp, Winfield Edgerly said that Cook and that Keogh went to the Ford with Reno's column and may have even crossed with him. Edgerly said that as Keogh was in charge of a squadron of Custer's battalion, he didn't need to be with his own company at that point. Edgerly thought that they went to the river to be in the fight with Reno, expecting Custer to follow Reno into the village. Reno would also testify at the Reno Court of Inquiry that Lieutenant Cook and Captain Miles Keogh rode with him for some time until he and his men crossed the Little Bighorn River. Scout Gerard would tell Walter Camp that after he had crossed with Reno's column, he realized now the Indians were coming up to meet Reno. He wanted to let Custer know this immediately, so he rode back to where Cook was, about a half a mile to three-fourths of a mile east of the ford. Cook said, well, Gerard, what's the matter now? And Gerard told him that the Indians were coming up the valley and showing fight rather than running away. Cook said, all right, Gerard, you go ahead and I will go back and report. This information may have convinced Custer to change his plan of attack, knowing that the Indians were no longer fleeing, but now coming up to meet Reno. Custer seems to have decided on a standard cavalry tactic and tried to create a pincher movement, attacking the village in the flank. Reno himself will suggest this in his official report after the battle. Whatever the reason, Custer's column did not follow Reno. The last man to see Custer and his command alive was trumpeter John Martin. Martin was a member of Benteen's H Company, and he was acting as an orderly for Custer that day. He said in a later interview, Custer halted his command on a high ridge, and officers looked down at the village through glasses. Custer made a speech to his men saying, we will go down and make a crossing and capture the village. Then the command, attention, fours right, column right, march, was given. And the command went forward down off the hill and the column left and the whole command passed down a ravine toward the dry creek. About a mile and a half from there, Adjutant Cook halted 
and gave Martin a message to give to Benteen. Come on, big village, be quick, bring packs. Delivering this message would save Martin's life. After riding a while away from Custer's column, Martin heard firing and he looked down from a ridge and thought he saw Indians swarming like bees toward the river ford. And that he saw Custer's men retreating from the water crossing. Okay, from here on, I'll briefly, and I know I'm barely touching the surface here, guys. I'm gonna roughly lay out a couple different theories on what may have happened to Captain Miles Keough. One theory is that after this, Keough was deployed with his I and C companies with Calhoun's L company on Calhoun Hill, while Custer continued moving north along Battle Ridge. Keough was covering Custer's advance and also leaving a path open for Benteen's battalion to eventually join the main column, expecting Benteen to heed that final order of, come on, be quick. From here, Keough and his men would have been able to see Weir Point and therefore would have been aware of the arrival of Captain Weir's D Company there. Keough also would have assumed troops on Weir Point meant Reno and Benteen were coming. All right, here's a different angle or different view of the battlefield. Okay, meanwhile, warriors on foot were making their way around Keough and they are the red flags on this map by Jeff Lackey. It's when the Indians started to stampede the cavalry horses and while mounted warriors were also doing bravery runs to break the line of US soldiers, perhaps led by the Oglala Sioux warrior Crazy Horse, that things really just disintegrated, ultimately starting a collapse that spread outward with the survivors on foot or on horseback, desperately trying to reach Custer on Last Stand Hill. Said the warrior Gaul, the first two companies Keo and Calhoun dismounted and fought on foot. They never broke, but retired step by step until forced back to the ridge upon which they all perished. They were shot down in line where they stood. Keo's company rallied by company and were all killed in a bunch. Keo's left leg and knee were badly shattered by a gunshot wound, and Comanche also had a corresponding wound. The bullet entered Comanche's right shoulder and emerged from the left, exactly where Keo's knee would have been, which indicates, at least according to Little Bighorn historian Edward Luce, Keo rode Comanche to the last and both went down together. It's possible that Keo was the soldier Cheyenne warrior Two Moon described. We shoot, we ride, we shoot again. Soldiers in line drop but one man rides up and down the line, all the time shouting. He rode a sorrel horse with a white face and white forelegs. I don't know who he was. He was a brave man. Little Soldier, another Sioux warrior, said Keo, or a man fitting his description, remained with his horse till the end. While most U.S. soldiers shot their horses in order to use them as a breastwork for protection, Indians say that Keo knelt between his horse's front legs and shot from under his breast. Little Soldier said that Keo died gripping his mount's reins tightly in his hands and that no Indian would take the horse off a dead man still holding the reins. Keo's body was found surrounded by his sergeants and his men. Another theory is that Keo's I Company led the advance to the Medicine Tail River Crossing, otherwise known as Ford B. Native accounts say that they managed to stop the soldiers from making a crossing at the river and that some soldiers were injured there. Then the soldiers fell back. We know the body of Keo's Lieutenant James Porter was never found. However, Godfrey said that when he was later burning the empty village, he found Porter's buckskin blouse in the village. 
and Porter's horse, Fritz, was also found dead in the village. And there is evidence that Keo also may have been shot at the crossing. Wrote Sergeant Edward B. Crombie, Troop I of the 7th Cavalry, quote, at the spot where General Custer attempted to cross the Little Bighorn River but was ambushed, we discovered a low patent shoe belonging to Captain Keo, and close to it, a bloody canvas legging. Multiple accounts say that two days after the battle, Comanche was found near the river. So, Keo, was he shot near the river and wounded, placed on a fresh horse, and then taken with the rest of I Company to where his body was later found? Eyewitnesses who found the bodies point to how there seemed to be less cohesion in the Keo sector compared to other parts of the battlefield, especially compared to where Calhoun and his men were found. Is it because their commander Keo was severely wounded and died in the beginning or during the fight? Is that why his NCOs were found surrounding him? On June 27th, General Terry and Colonel Gibbon arrived and brought word to the besieged 7th Cavalry members that everyone with Custer's column had been killed. On June 28th, the survivors went out on the battlefield. The bodies had been badly mutilated and they'd also been sitting in the sweltering sun for three days. The survivors ID'd the bodies they could and then they had to bury their friends and comrades. Remember, every U.S. soldier in Custer's command was dead, more than 200 of them. They fought desperately. They ran out of ammo and they were overrun by the superior forces of the Lakota and Cheyenne. But during a battle, not every single person on the losing side dies. Death is not that easy. Like any fight in the aftermath, there are scores of wounded. Well, these wounded had been finished off by the Lakota and Cheyenne victors. Many were killed by stone mallets. Many were cut to pieces. The survivors found charred and decapitated heads, limbs separated from bodies, hearts on rope lariats. Some men were identified by gold fillings in their teeth, buttons, tattoos. One officer was ID'd by a shattered glass eye. Keo, though he had had the terrible gunshot wound to his knee and he was shot three more times, had not been mutilated. This is how Lieutenant Godfrey describes the scene. Keo was in a depression just north or below Calhoun Hill and on the slope of the ridge that forms the defensive line furthest from the river. The body was stripped, except for the socks, and these had the name cut off. In life, he wore a Catholic medal suspended from his neck. It was not removed. Keo was buried where he fell in a shallow grave near his men. This image you see there is from the Little Bighorn Visitor Center. Like this example, Keo's name was written on a small piece of paper that was rolled up and put into an empty cartridge shell casing. They found stakes from abandoned teepee poles, and then they took those shell casings with the name inside and they hammered them into the tip of the stake and then drove the stake into the earth near the bodies for future identification. Or have they fought with Cabrun? Their names we keep where the Fenians sleep, need the shroud of The following summer, in 1877, a retrieval and reburial party went out to the battlefield. Here, I'm going to zoom a little bit. This is a map done a few years later of where the bodies were found. The party was led by Captain Michael Sheridan, who was General Phil Sheridan's brother. Joining him was the reconstituted Company I with scouts who had been at the Little Bighorn fight, including Herondine, Half Yellowface, and Curly. They reburied and cleaned up the graves of the enlisted men and they exhumed the bodies of most of the officers. The body of Miles Keough, as he had written to Nellie Martin, was sent to Auburn, New York. But burying the dead was not so easy. The weather and storms kept washing away the meager dirt placed over the bodies. This famous photo was taken in spring 1879 
by the photographer Stanley Morrow when a first memorial to the soldiers was built and many of the horse bones littering the field were collected. Now, I want you to look at the photo just beyond the Keogh marker. See a marker that says Wild Eye? Well, Little Bighorn historian author Fred Dustin assumed this referred to Eye Company and that they were known as Wild Eye. Well, he was wrong. This is actually the marker for a soldier who was found by the 1877 reburial crew, a Corporal Wild of Eye troop. His body was discovered in June 1877 in the brush near Ford B. That's the river crossing folks. His remains were identified by some personal items and his trousers, and they were collected and he was buried with his troop mates. And here I wanna share one more cool photo. Dustin made quite a few other assumptions about Keogh that I don't entirely agree with. So while we're at it, let's address a few other myths about Miles Keogh. Was Keogh a heavy drinker? There are certainly accounts of his being under the influence of alcohol. Libby Custer mentions an Irish officer who became so hopelessly boozy that his striker, Finnegan, kept his money and his valuables in his own quarters. This wasn't unheard of, as Captain Thomas Weir, another officer who drank a little too much, did the same thing. And his striker and his maid, on occasion, would hold on to Weir's money and then follow him around when he got drunk so he didn't fall. In 1911, a one-time hospital steward at Fort Wallace named David Burton Long recalled, Captain Keogh was fine looking, a perfect soldier in appearance, but he would, as many other officers in the army did, get drunk and do stunts that would make the American people blush. One night around 12 o'clock in his drunken condition, he had boots and saddles sounded. He got his company out and made a cavalry charge over the prairie for an hour or two after an imaginary enemy. But most negative comments about Keogh come from author Fred Dustin. Dustin claimed he had heard from two soldiers from Keogh's eye company, Charles Pryor and another fellow nicknamed Buddy, that Keogh got, quote, drunk enough to be ugly, and that Keogh chased one of them with a cane that had a silver dog's head for a handle. And he was not hesitant in using it on the heads of enlisted men that incurred his displeasure. Then Dustin relates how Buddy got into a physical altercation with a sergeant from I Company. Keogh and his cane chased this Buddy character around demanding, what did you hurt, hit my sergeant for? Because of this, Buddy and Pryor deserted. Well, I don't know about you, but I imagine nobody would take kindly to a soldier punching his sergeant. And as the men promptly deserted, they had a motive to malign Keogh. And he, being their leadership, and now long dead, certainly could not defend himself. Dustin was perhaps not the most objective audience when it came to Keogh either, as he wrote in his book, quote, Keogh was one of those drunken brutes that were relics of the war, a soldier of fortune merely like many Irishmen of his type. Well, that comment is a grossly inadequate stereotype against so many Irish who fought nobly and died tragically for their adopted country. Keogh was, quote, no drunken brute in the eyes of his soldier, Henry Allen Bailey, who wrote home, we have got a quite a fine lot of officers my captain's name is M.W. Keogh. He is a nice man. He says I am the best blacksmith he ever had in his company. And Bailey also wrote home one winter, I ironed off a sled for the captain last week and he gave me $10. I am going to have a ride in it with the first sergeant. And there are other officers who greatly respected their captain. So I'm not disputing that Keogh may have drank more than was good for him but we have examples of officers who were arrested or confined to their tents for drink-related infractions. Keogh was not one of them. We've also shown in part one how Custer was frustrated with Keogh's repeated sick leaves and he ordered a military surgeon to examine him. Custer was a teetotaler, he didn't drink at all. If he thought the source of Keogh's illnesses were due to alcoholism and that it affected Keogh's ability to be an officer, I do not think Custer would have stood for it. And just to put drinking in some kind of context, these officers of the 7th, who we all know rather well in this study, did drink to the degree that it led to court martials, ruined their careers, and in some cases it ended their lives. Cooper, 
Reno, Benteen, French, and Weir. And there were several other lesser known officers of the 7th who were severely affected as well. So why wasn't Keo's body mutilated? It was thought the warriors didn't mutilate Keo because of his holy medals. So what was he wearing? Some say he was wearing the Agnes Day. Trumpeter John Martin, who was born in Italy, said Keo had a gold chain and Agnes Day Catholic emblem on his neck, which the Indians had not taken, and Benteen secured this. Libby Custer also remembered Keo wearing an Agnes Day. And as mentioned, Godfrey told a finding on Keo's body, in life he wore a Catholic medal suspended from his neck and it was not removed. The Agnes Day is a medal that has an image of a lamb, sometimes with a heart as well as a cross and a banner. Agnes Day actually means lamb of God and therefore symbolizes Jesus. It's one of the Catholic Church's oldest sacramentals and it's been used to trace or it's been traced back to the sixth century. These medals were often blessed by popes. So it's kind of interesting to think that Keo may have gotten his Agnes Day while he was serving in Rome. The lamb reminds the wearer of the lamb's blood that protected Jewish households from the avenging angel in Exodus. And it was thus worn in protection against sudden and spiritually unprovided death or to help secure a happy death as well as offer protection in combat and the power to ensure victory. Remember the snake bite survivor, Francis Johnson Kennedy? Well, he was an Irishman and his parents wanted him to be a priest, right? He too said Keo was wearing a Catholic medal. He thought it was a golden crucifix. The Sioux warrior Paints Brown said the warriors mistook Keo for a priest. Paints Brown said, we were looking around and found Captain Keo, but left him alone, for we saw that he wore a scapulary and we thought he was a black robe man. Others think Keo was wearing the papal military medals he received for his service in the Pope's army. We know that Keo wore these on his uniform and photos, and, but would he have taken something so precious on the summer campaign? He lost the originals in 1865 in a fire, but he had copies made, a full-size set and a miniature set. His family in Ireland reputedly have a set to this day. Now, as you can see, and my friend Jeff Lackey pointed this out to me, look how similar the medals are that Keo has as those worn by Father DeSmet, who was a Catholic missionary much loved by the Sioux. Whatever Keo wore around his neck, and enough eyewitness mention it that you know he had to have had something on, the warriors recognized the religious value and respected his body because of it. And if you're skeptical, here's an image of Oglala Chief Red Cloud's bedroom, and you can see how the Catholic iconography was revered. But as Benteen and no one else wrote a detailed description or drew a sketch of what Keo was wearing, we'll never know exactly. Personally, knowing Keo was worried about this coming campaign, I think it's possible he wore everything that could have brought him divine protection. The Lone Survivor Comanche. Contrary to popular belief, Comanche was not Keo's horse. Comanche was owned by the United States Army and he belonged to I Company. Keo's personal horse was a mount named Paddy. But Keo and Comanche will forever be united when we talk about the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This description by surviving soldier William O. Taylor tells of finding Comanche, Comanche a couple days after the fight, and it probably sums it up best. We had gone but a short distance when over toward the river amongst the bushes was seen a cavalry horse. Upon investigation, it proved to be the horse of Captain Keo, a clay blank in sorrel color named Comanche. He was stripped of all equipment and it was a pitiful sight, there being no less than seven wounds on his body from bullet and arrow from which the blood had hardly dried. On his mane where there was no wound, there was some dried blood, which was probably the blood of Captain Keo. The horse certainly bore a charmed life, for he had been wounded once before in an Indian battle while ridden by Captain Keo. Major Reno gave orders that the horse be secured and taken along with the command. Hugh Scout, who later joined I Company, wrote, Keo rode a horse named Paddy up to the fight and then changed to Old Comanche. 
Captain Kia's leg was found broken, as if the bullet had traversed Comanche's body. Captain Nolan was the acting quartermaster on the staff of General Terry. When he reached the battlefield on June 27th, he took charge of Comanche, too badly wounded to have been taken off by the Sioux, and the only thing left there in sight. Captain Nolan's affection for Captain Keogh was all that caused him to make the attempt to save an animal so badly wounded, and Comanche was placed aboard the steamer far west with the other wounded and hurried down to the station of the regiment at Fort Abraham Lincoln. Thomas McDougall wrote, I took Troop B on the 28th to the Indian village to look for implements to use in burying the dead. Upon crossing the river, I found Keogh's horse in the bushes and detailed one of the men to look after him until I reported to Reno, which I did immediately. And McDougall also wrote, I found Comanche on the village side of the river, opposite the mouth of the deep gully. Godfrey also adamantly said Comanche was found at the flat at the Indian village, which also supports that Keogh and Comanche may have been shot trying to cross at Medicine Tail or Ford B. Other soldiers remember finding Comanche closer to Last Stand Hill. Private Dennis Lynch wrote, Comanche stood at Custer Hill, near where the monument is, head dropped, shot five times. He recognized his friends. When the men came up and called him by name, he nickered, wounded by a bullet shot in the chest, which came out from the left side, shot just above the hoof in one of his forefeet, shot twice in the neck and through the loins, dressed his wounds the first time by orders by Nolan. Comanche was dressed with a zinc wash on the 28th and that night started for the boat. Comanche limped down to the boat with the men carrying the wounded. Well, from that day forward, Comanche lived the high life, remaining an honored and pampered member of the 7th Cavalry until his death in 1891. And when he died, his body was preserved and he remains on exhibit at the University of Kansas to this day. Your deeds did speak loud If your body could see you I know they'd be proud the symbol of bravery at the little big horn poor old Comanche your battle scarred and torn Did Keo introduce the song Gary Owen to the 7th Cavalry? The Irish song that became the regimental song for the 7th Cavalry is often attributed to Keogh, but a friend of George Custer's from West Point remembered Custer asking him to play Gary Owen and the Girl I Left Behind Me when they were cadets. And Custer's wife Libby remembered Custer having a band play Gary Owen at the end of the Civil War whenever he was asked to make a speech and didn't have one prepared. So the song was at least familiar to Custer before Keogh joined the 7th Cavalry. Though it's possible Keogh, when he was first assigned to Custer's newly formed 7th in November 1866, may have helped choose Gary Owen as the regimental song. At the Battle of the Washita, the band was playing Gary Owen when they first charged the village. Well, at least they were trying to play it before the instruments froze on their lips. And Keogh was absent from that fight. Gary Owen was the final song that the regimental band played before the 7th left the Powder River Depot on June 15, 1876. The band stayed behind but was posted on a knoll overlooking the river. Soldier Theodore Golden would remember, they played merrily while we were fording the river. After all were across, the band broke into the rollicking strains of Gary Owen, which as usual brought a hearty cheer and its notes were ringing in our ears as we left the river bottom and the band was lost to sight. This is the final verse. Our hearts so stout have got us fame, for soon tis known from whence we came. Where we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen in glory. <laughs> Was Keogh a member of the Custer Circle? Remember from part one how Custer wanted to have Keogh join his regiment during the Civil War and considered Keogh one of the flowers of the army? So 
clearly there was considerable respect between these officers, but they had their ups and downs. When Custer was court-martialed in 1867, one of his officers wrote him a letter telling him who he could depend on, saying, Hamilton, I think, is friendly to you. Keogh is not. There was the flower situation, you guys remember that, that I mentioned in part one, where Custer also did not appreciate being Keogh's delivery boy and having to pay for and bring flowers to Keogh's crush. Custer also wrote his wife Libby saying of Keogh, I do think him rather absurd, absurd, but would rather have him stationed near me than many others, which might sum things up best. They might not have been the best of friends, but of many officers to choose from, Custer wanted to have Keogh close by. And as my friend Dale pointed out, Custer and Keogh didn't actually serve together that often out west. Keogh arrived at Fort Abraham Lincoln in May of 1875. So these two famous images you're seeing right now on the screen might sort of give a false impression of a very close friendship that didn't exist. Ooh, this is a good one. Was Keogh in a relationship with Nellie Martin? Well, unlike Custer, Keogh was undoubtedly very friendly with Nellie. It was a letter to Nellie that I read in the opening of this video. Remember if I should die, you may believe that I loved you and every member of your family. But was there a love affair? We saw in part one that Keogh did try to court a few women, and I haven't come across any evidence that says Nellie was one of them. It's been said that they didn't marry because of religious differences, as Keogh was Catholic and Nellie was Episcopalian. But you'll remember from part one that one of the things Keogh liked about America was, all religions are in the same boat. Be you a Catholic or Protestant, you're only judged by your merits as a man. And though we did spend some time talking about the Catholic medals Keogh wore at his death, he was not necessarily the best Catholic. He once wrote to his brother Tom in Ireland, it's three and a half years since I heard mass, except for one celebrated in a tent. And he also wrote in another letter, why I have so many notices of excommunication, I feel strange if I waken and don't find one waiting for me every morning now. The Martin family seemed to wholeheartedly welcome Keogh into their fold. And he knew Nellie for a decade. Nellie was born the same year as Keogh, which means that when he died, she, too, was 36 years old, and the average age of marriage for women in the 1860s and 1870s was 22, 23. So, I don't know, maybe she was seen as beyond a marriageable age. Maybe she was more of a sisterly figure to Keo than a love interest, which does not detract from their relationship at all, as her love was as constant and true as love could be. Nellie was there when Keogh's body arrived in Auburn, New York in August, August 15th, 1877. She wrote to Keogh's sister in Ireland, I longed to have you by my side as we went to receive the precious boy that we might weep together. But I am glad you were not here for it was too sorrowful a sight. My brother and sisters and myself went to the station to receive the body and placing it in one of our wagons instead of a hearse we took him to the receiving vault. We left flowers upon it and left it reluctantly, for we feel it contains the remains of our darling. On October 25th, Keogh was buried in the family plot. The city of Auburn went into mourning. All the flags were hung at half mast. At 2 p.m., pallbearers started down the city street, accompanied by a company of the 29th Volunteer Regiment, and fittingly enough, a band, the hearse was draped in red, white, and blue, and the Martin family and others followed in a carriage. A year later, the monument was finished. The inscription reads, Sleep, soldier, still in honored rest, your truth and valor wearing. The bravest are the tenderest, the loving are the daring. A few years later, his sister in Ireland commissioned the cross that you see there. And this is where Keogh remains today. Whatever the truth of the story might be, Nellie never married, and she faithfully put flowers on Keogh's grave on his birthday and the anniversary of his death for 50 years until she herself died at the age of 87 years old. The photo there on the left is from the Little Bighorn Battlefield in Montana, and it marks the place where Captain Keogh fell. And 
how does Arlen remember their native 7th Cavalry son? Well, there's a memorial to him in County Carlow. The inscription reads, the colonel from Lachlan who died in one of the greatest battles to grip the public imagination, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, or what became known as Custer's Last Stand. Keogh's pipe is at the County Carlow Museum and St. Joseph's Catholic Church in Lachlan, where Keogh family members were parishioners, has this stained glass window memorial. I'm going to zoom a little bit so we can see the inscription. Erected to the memory of Thomas Kehoe and his wife Alice and his brother, Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Miles Kehoe, Captain 7th Cavalry, USA, killed in action, 25 June 1876. Rest in peace. Miles Kehoe has been portrayed in countless movies and novels, including the Disney movie Tonka, and even John Wayne has a little soliloquy about him in John Ford's movie She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. Miles Keogh was born in County Carlow, Ireland, soldier of the Papal Armies in Rome, then served as an officer of distinction during the American Civil War as well as the Indian Wars out west. He will forever be a part of the myth and the romance connected to the Battle of the Little Bighorn. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining me today. As always, please like, subscribe, put on that notification bell and come back soon. Oh, and leave me a comment. I love to hear from you. Give me a suggestion of what you think I should do next. And apologies if I mispronounced Miles Keogh's last name. I got a lot of comments from different people giving me different ways that it's pronounced in Ireland. And I think I'm probably totally off base, but I tried. All right guys, credits are next. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you for everyone who helped me out. And as always, thank you for watching.